Welcome to Little Lectures, making learning and teaching easy for residents and students on the go. Join our residents from the University of Louisville as they share the highest yield internal medicine topics in digestible chunks. Hi, this is Laura Bishop. I'm a MedPeds hospitalist here at the University of Louisville. I am the Executive Director of Louisville Lectures and here today to give a little lecture on COVID-19. This is a lecture series really aimed at giving you what you need to know to take care of patients right now on the front lines. My disclaimer is that this is an emerging disease, so things are rapidly changing. If you are currently taking care of a patient you suspect of having COVID or confirmed COVID, please look at the CDC's latest guidelines and contact your state and health department for more up-to-date information. In part one, I talked a little bit about COVID as a virus, I defined some public health terms, and I talked a little bit about the, some symptoms associated with COVID. Today, I wanna to talk more about the natural course of COVID-19, as well as a little bit about some of the presenting exam findings and lab findings you might see. So once one is exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it takes about two to 11 days to be symptomatic. So this is called the incubation period. The median incubation period is about five days, but it can be longer or shorter. The most common symptoms are fever, dry cough, malaise, fatigue, myalgias, particularly back pain. Now all of this very much sounds like the flu. So these are flu-like symptoms but you can also have GI symptoms. So nausea, abdominal pain, and diarrhea have definitely been noted in COVID-19 patients. Some patients have reported anosmia or lack of smell, as well as anorexia, loss of appetite. But keep your differential open because some patients have presented with encephalopathy, acute kidney injury, they've been presenting with cardiac symptoms so everything from PEA to new onset AFib to myo and pericarditis in pediatric patients specifically think of what your peds patients with a typical URI present like so in your chronic kids it could be failure to thrive it could be nausea and diarrhea so really keep your differential very open for covid-19 so you've had symptoms and usually around day 5 of symptomatic illness patients will start to see respiratory symptoms if they're developing a bilateral pneumonia. Some patients will develop this pneumonia and this is really due to a direct viral attack on the lung parenchyma. Compare this to day 10 when patients who are developing severe COVID-19 tend to have more symptoms from cytokine surge. So all of this cytokines will lead to ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. This ARDS can be accompanied by multi-organ system dysfunction. So usually by day 10, you'll see these really severe symptoms and these patients will need to be hospitalized if they are not already. When we think about the distribution of these patients, about 80% will have mild symptoms and will be fine at home for home care. However, maybe up to 15% of patients may require hospitalization, and of that, the total, about 5% of people could require critical care for COVID-19. The mean duration of illness is about two weeks, but those with severe COVID-19 can have anywhere from three to six weeks of illness. And it's of noting that in some studies, up to 25% had a concomitant disease. So if you have a patient with a positive respiratory viral panel or a positive flu swab, that doesn't mean they don't also have COVID-19. So it's really important to know what signs to look for on the history and physical, as well as our laboratory findings that can support COVID-19. All right. So you listened to episode one and you know what to suspect and when to suspect COVID-19. Hopefully the patient has contacted you somehow virtually and at this time you can help triage them appropriately. So if they have mild symptoms and are not high risk, they can likely be managed at home without even getting a swab. If they need to come in to see you, then you can manage them in a way that reduces transmission to others and have a testing center up that's available for them. However, if they have arrived to your clinic or the ED first, your first step of triaging for whether they've had three simple things, fever, cough, or trouble breathing, then you should mask them immediately to reduce transmission of viral particles. 
if the patient isn't masked for whatever reason, the provider definitely needs to have a, a mask as well as a face shield or other eye protection. And at this point, you can proceed with your normal evaluation and stabilization. So if the patient needs stabilized, make sure that you notify the provider and get the patient, if they're in an ambulatory setting, to the emergency department, making sure that you notify both EMS and the emergency department of your concern for COVID-19. When you obtain your HPI and review of systems, make sure that you're asking some of the COVID particular questions from above as well as thinking about other possible causes. So not to um, focus only on COVID, we're still going to have patients who have trouble breathing and hypoxia who have heart failure exacerbations. So now I'm gonna tell you to identify relevant history. However, this matters less once you're in an area that has endemic community acquired COVID. But for now, you could ask your patients, especially in an area with low prevalence, if they've recently traveled, been around someone who traveled, been around someone who was ill, or been around someone that was confirmed to have COVID. If any of these trigger a positive concern for COVID, it's time to move that patient to a private room. Make sure that that room is in isolation and everyone who knows goes in with the appropriate personal protective equipment. Personal protective equipment is so hard to say. Sorry, Victoria, I just had to say that. If you have someone in a high risk group in your waiting room, whether it's an ER or an outpatient facility, make sure that you're quickly moving them back to a room so that they are less exposed. So that would be anyone who is elderly, has a chronic disease or is immunosuppressed. So what do you wear if your patient is in isolation? So the initial CDC recommendations mentioned an N95 mask out of an abundance of caution. At this point, they're more concerned about this being passed along like any upper respiratory disease. The CDC recently released a statement on cloth face coverings for the general public, and they are recommended in public settings where other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain, especially in areas of significant community-based transmission. So this helps to slow the spread of virus and keep people who may have the virus and be asymptomatic from spreading their personal droplets to others. These may be used in practice in the setting of an office for patients who do not have active symptoms of coronavirus. You could recommend that your patients bring their own face covering in, or they may be used for places in the hospital where you will not be having direct patient contact. So perhaps staff in medical records would be wearing cloth face coverings. They do not replace PPE when caring for patients who are symptomatic or suspected of having COVID. So they recommend for a patient with suspected or known COVID to have on a face mask, a face shield or protective eyewear, and then contact, which would be your gown and gloves. So that's for our patients that you're concerned about and you're not doing aerosolizing procedures. For a person who you are doing an aerosolizing procedure for, you should wear either an N95 with face mask as well as your gown and gloves, or you should wear a PAPR, which would be a personal air purifying respirator. So what's an aerosolizing procedure? Anything that generates droplets in the air. So that could be a nebulizing procedure, obtaining the COVID PCR from the nasopharynx. It could be providing high flow nasal cannula or BiPAP and intubation. So it's important during these times that you have the right personal protective equipment. An isolation for the patient in a non-ICU would be a single room with the door closed. Depending on your hospital capacity, it may become that these patients need to be cohorted together if they have the same virus. But for now, the recommendation stands at a single patient per room. In the ICU, there's a higher likelihood of having aerosolizing procedures. So if possible, patients could be in negative pressure isolation or a room with a HEPA filter. In terms of your exam, vitals are probably going to be the most important thing because these patients might have fever and these fevers typically last seven to 10 days. And you really wanna make sure that you're getting a good count of respirations and pulse oximetry because patients will, that I have seen have often not have the typical respiratory distress, no retractions, no belly breathing, no labored breathing, or really ability, inability to incomplete sentences. However, they are hypoxic and tachypnic. So those are important findings. And really there's not a lot to remark upon on the lung exam as well. On your laboratory evaluation, it's very important to obtain a CBC with a diff as up to 80% of patients have been noted to have lymphopenia. And you can see lower platelets and this may be a harbinger of more severe disease down the road. 
Most patients, due to the inflammatory response, if they are requiring admission to the hospital, will tend to have elevated inflammatory markers, including CRP, C-reactive protein, as well as ferritin. Keep in mind, these are still nonspecific and will be elevated also in a patient with bacterial sepsis. Slightly less common, but still reported, are elevated AST, ALT, alkaline phosphatase, creatinine kinase, lactate dehydrogenase, and D-dimer. Typically, these patients will have a normal procalcitonin. If indicated by the current CDC guidelines and your state or local health department, you can obtain a coronavirus PCR. However, keep in mind that this only has about an 80% sensitivity, so really think about the positive predictive value for your individual patient, looking at their pretest probability as well as the prevalence of your local institution. Radiologic findings are very big in this disease. So many patients, even if asymptomatic, will have these findings. You wanna look for bilateral inter interstitial infiltrates that are indicative of a viral pneumonia. However, at least one of my patients has presented with what appeared to initially be a more typical consolidated bacterial pneumonia and then later developed the bilateral viral pattern. So be cautious, but this is again, not the only thing to consider when wondering whether your patient has COVID. And I would recommend to look at every one of your patient's chest x-rays, as there are also reports of asymptomatic patients who have presented for orthopedic concerns who have had the COVID typical chest x-ray pattern. And the findings alone don't predict severity, obviously, if you have asymptomatic patients who also have these findings. If you were to obtain a CT scan, you would be looking for ground glass opacities, um, and not surprisingly will be there most often in patients with severe disease, although not all patients with these opacities will have severe disease. So the short of it is, if you have a bilateral pneumonia on chest x-ray that appears viral, you have leukopenia, you have normal procalcitonin, possibly an elevated CRP or ferritin if you check them, you should be treating your patient as though they have COVID even if the COVID PCR is pending or negative. So take home point number one is that the incubation period is variable and can be long. So start to watch your patients for symptoms, and after about five days of symptoms, they may require hospitalization or oxygen. After around 10 days of symptoms, and usually about one day or less of hospitalization, they will tend to crash and go into ARDS if they're going to develop severe disease. Take home point number two is that you should wear a face mask and eye protection in addition to gown and glove when you are taking care of COVID patients, whether they're suspected or positive. If you are doing an aerosolizing procedure or a present for one, you should wear a N95 mask or a PAPR. Take home point number three is to evaluate your patient for leukopenia as well as elevated CRP and ferritin with a normal procalcitonin and make sure you get a chest x-ray and look for viral bilateral pneumonia, so interstitial infiltrates throughout the lungs. If you have a CT scan, look for ground glass opacities. And I would remind you and caution you that these are a constellation of symptoms. So really think about all of the factors when you're considering whether your patient has COVID and should be isolated because we really run the fine balance of wanting to conserve our PPE on one hand and wanting to not infect other patients or healthcare workers on the other. So stay safe, stay healthy, work on your distance socializing and wash your hands. Thanks for listening and learning with us. If you would like more information on this topic, please take a look at our full-size Louisville Lectures, either on louisvillelectures.org, on our YouTube channel, or on our podcast.